Good evening, my fellow maths enthusiasts. I hope you've all been keeping really well. I hope you had a lovely Halloween and a lovely Halloween weekend. Now, we have a lot to cover off. I obviously didn't come on because I'm a Halloween fanatic and I had lots to be doing over the last couple of nights. So, what I'm going to do is cover four episodes in this video, but I'm going to timestamp everything so that you can skip ahead if you want to skip ahead. So we're going to be covering episodes 26, 27, 28, 29 in plain English. It's most of last week. So we've got the couple swap to talk about. We have got the dinner party and we've got the homestays to talk about. So lots to do. Let's get cracking. Now, just for context, where these kind of four episodes begin, it's right after the aftermath of Holly and Alex leaving, Casper and Emma had left, Christina and Kieran are absolutely just up shit creek without a paddle, and currently Lacey is really pissed off at Luke because after, you know, that salsa class where Lacey was hanging off Adam by her fanny and a picture was sent, Luke had mentioned to Amy privately, by the way, privately, he mentioned to his partner, that he's kind of happy Amy conducts herself with a bit more class. Now, was that a bit of a low blow? Absolutely. Can you understand why Lacey would hear that and be offended? A hundred percent. I would absolutely. But I also did have a bit of a side eye. Like, why would Amy bring that up? That she really just threw him under the bus. But that's kind of where we're heading into now with these four episodes. So 26 is the partner swap episode and they just shuffle around the people so Sasha and Ross basically swap with Christina and Kieran. Lacey then is partnered with Luke, Polly is partnered with Nathan and Adam is partnered with Amy. Now Polly right out the gate says she's not a jealous person which laughable she's not a jealous person but Amy is really stunning so she's not feeling too great about this and she doesn't like the idea of another woman moving into her home because the home is sacred it's a really intimate space and she sticks a picture of her and Adam above the bed now it's done as a joke Amy gets a kick out of it Adam kind of highlights that it was done as a joke there's nothing too serious about all of this but we all kind of know based on what we've seen of Polly and her behaviour so far, particularly towards the women, that she is extremely jealous as a person. She's very easily threatened by other females. And as much as she likes to say like, haha joke, we kind of know that she's not totally joking. Now, in this case, I feel like she's very vindicated. I feel like she definitely has reason to be jealous here because I have to say, and maybe I'm alone, maybe I am on an island with this one, I definitely felt a very weird vibe between Adam and Amy. So Amy obviously moves into their apartment. They have the laugh about the picture being over the bed. And straight away they're like, so what about, you know, sleeping arrangements? And there's this weird look that's lingering between the two of them. And these, like they're both kind of grinning. Yeah, it's just there's something that didn't sit completely right with me. And I think, am I right in saying that they're the only two who shared a bed during this partner swap episode. And they both kind of say, oh, we're close, we're comfortable with each other. That's great. Like maybe they are buddies, maybe they are friendly. I've never noticed them being particularly, you know, (laughs) buddy, buddy and bantery together. However, they just both seemed a little bit too happy and too ready to um, agree on that sleeping arrangement. But anyway, they waste no time and they're off to a lingerie shop and they're going to pick out some sexy lingerie for Polly. Now, speaking of the she-devil, she's over with Nathan. They are in the gym and they're working out because Nathan is going to show Polly how he blows off some steam, how he kind of deals with his stress. And we learn that Polly has ADHD. Now, we might have actually been told this before. I'm not 100%. If we were, I've either missed it or completely forgotten about it. But just to have a moment as a total nerd, I found this fascinating. Just they're so, so different. And it amazes me that something like ADHD presents so differently person to person. Like it's not one size fits all. It's, I just found that really, really interesting. But anyway, Polly is kind of commenting to Nathan that, you know, it's great that Lacey is very interested in asking you about your ADHD and how you manage it. Whereas Adam doesn't really ask me anything about it. And he's aware that I have it, but it's just, it's not something that he thinks to ask about. So they're having this kind of nice moment where they're connecting on this and they're working out and it seems to be a nice day. But then a text comes through to Polly's phone from Adam 
asking what's your bra size now we know obviously he's off in an Ann Summers doing some lingerie shopping for Polly Polly is super jealous that he's with Amy so anything right now is going to trigger her but Nathan you know he swoops in he's the voice of reason he's basically saying what we're all thinking like well hold on a second it's pretty obvious he's buying you something and it sounds like it's along the lines of something you might like. Is this not good? You're complaining that you want more intimacy. And let's just like pause and rewind. So before this text came through and before Polly and Nathan were talking about their ADHD, they were like punching the bag and Polly was talking about how sexually frustrated she was. And at one point she's punching this bag like with all of her might and she's saying this is what I'm going to do to Adam if he doesn't put out. Now, granted, that was a joke. And also granted, if the genders were reversed and it was Ross saying, you know, this is what I'm going to do if Sasha doesn't put out soon when she was on her celibacy buzz, like we probably would have gone, oh, it's a bit of a shitty joke. But Polly is making it very clear before this text to Nathan that she's sexually frustrated. She wants more boom boom. Like it's not intimacy like tell me your deepest, darkest secrets. She like fair enough would like that too but she also wants the sexy time now when Nathan tries to say is this not a good thing is this not what you wanted you know he's obviously off shopping for some naughty things she's like no I feel sick to my stomach like he's gone from zero to 100 like what the hell is going on here so she's really really upset and Nathan is just left there super awkward like what am I supposed to do? What do I say? Do I give her a hug? Do I let her cry it out? Do I excuse myself and go hide in the bathroom? Per Nathan has like done his time. He has dealt with so many women crying at him that are not his wife on this experiment. And he is the least offensive person. I I need to apologize for the 80th time. I misjudged him so much. He's a really, really sweet soul. I can't believe I was so wrong about him. I can't believe my first impression of Nathan was so piss poor and I just, yeah, I had nearly written him off and he's turned out to be the nicest guy or one of the nicest guys on this. But anyway, Polly is super upset. And by evening time, you know, she's cuddling up in bed. She's a little bit cheered up and calmed down. Nathan's off out on the couch getting tucked in for the night. And then we go back over to Adam and Amy and they're getting, you know, cozy in bed together with their pathetic little teddy or two in between them as though you know this is their barrier and Adam's saying you sleep with your wedding ring on you know I can't really sleep with my wedding ring on I have to take it off and he kind of jokes you know I also like to sleep in the nude and they're kind of having a giggle and making it look like they're just buds who banter but like there's also that part of me that's like when those cameras go down they are going to be riding the arses off each other. Adam is going to be parking his car anywhere and everywhere. So <laughs> just like Polly, Polly needs to not bring a black light anywhere into that room because yeah, I just, I had a feeling. I just had a, a hunch and it's probably just me. This is my sick brain and everybody else is like, what the fuck are you talking about? That's just the vibe I got and let's just leave it there over with Lacey and Luke so they've obviously had a bit of conflict Luke has said the thing about the class and the dancing Lacey is not taken very kindly to it and they're now partnered together so of course conflict now they squash it straight away and Luke bakes her this cake that's in the shape of the word like I am sorry or sorry or something like that and Lacey she's one for the thought she likes a deep person <laughs> so Lacey is like Do you know what I take the apology we're cool we're fine and she appreciates the effort that went into the cake. Now, they do have some nice open conversations and they're discussing, you know, the the picture and the salsa dancing class where Lacey was kind of hanging off Adam. And Luke opens up a bit to Lacey. And I didn't perceive this at all as him bashing Amy. Some people might disagree and that's completely fair. I'm not gonna, you know, fight you on it. But he's saying that sometimes Amy's very stiff. You know, she's very serious when he kind of puts his arm around her or tries to hug her it feels like a wooden board like fair enough yeah that could be perceived as a bit of a dig but he's talking about Lacey letting loose and having fun in that dance class and he says you know part of me was really envious when I saw that picture because I would love for Amy to kind of have fun let her hair down and dance with me that way 
He did not say that he saw Lacey dancing with somebody else and he wished that Amy would go and do something like that. He wanted Amy to dance with him the way he saw Lacey dancing with Adam, say. And Lacey, there's no, like, she can't say she misunderstood. She can't say that this was a miscommunication because she basically repeats this back to us, the audience, in her confessional and confirms, like, Luke has told me that he wants this in his relationship with Amy. Now, that's an important thing to remember because this will later on be repeated to Amy and twisted into something that is not entirely accurate. So yeah, we will come back to this. But let's quickly talk about Sasha and Ross. So they've essentially swapped partners with Kieran and Christina. And instead of just taking the bloody day apart and letting Kieran and Christina have their time, they decide to do a double date. Now, I don't necessarily think that Sasha and Ross in planning this double date made them any worse than they already were. And I don't think that it was a terrible idea. I think it came from a really good place and it probably made a lot of sense at the time. But yeah, they just, they needed that space, I think. So Kieran is, he's having this like crisis of faith with regards to him and Christina and their future. And I just have to give props to Christina because Kieran's sitting here all morning with Sasha and he's making these freaking lists, like the pros and the cons of Christina and the similarities and the differences between Christina and my exes. Now, if I was Christina and I knew, because she's she's well aware that this is happening with the lists, if I knew that my partner was making these lists about me and trying to decide if I'm too much like their ex, if they can be with me, if I'm going to, you know, enrich their life or drag them down. I have to say, I think I would save them some serious hassle and some ink and I would tell them to shove the list up their arse and I would be gone. However, Christina's being patient and I don't know if she feels like she has to be this patient and this accepting of like what I'm just going to call a load of fuckery purely because she suffers from PMDD and she might be difficult at times to deal with and she's kind of trying to give extra grace to make up for that but look she's being a saint in my opinion by allowing him his time to do these lists and for Kieran I now listen I like Kieran I do not think that he is a bad guy at all I just want to start by saying that but I also suspect that he's either kidding himself or he's trying to kid us or Christina or whoever the hell he's trying to convince. Like he's not being real here. There's something that he is definitely holding back. And I don't know what that is. Is it that she's too much like your exes? Is it her PMDD? Is it that she's not serious about her career, her five-year plan, her future? He's now saying that he doesn't want a wife who's going to make him a priority. But then on the other time, he's like, oh, my ex was horrible to me. It just, it reeks of BS. There's something that just doesn't ring true. And I'm bereft listening to him. And it looks like Ross, because Ross and Sasha are here when they're talking about this. It looks like Ross is also very confused as to what the hell his actual root issue is here. And I'm wondering, is he just maybe too chicken to end it? Does he want her to be the one to end it, to save him, you know, the ugly duty of breaking up with her? Or are there reasons that he has that he's not prepared to say? I don't, like I said, I don't think he's a bad guy. I don't think he's got an ounce of badness in him. However, sometimes even the nicest people can act poorly, can make bad decisions And he just needs to get it together. He needs to piss or get off the pot because dragging this out more and more is going to hurt Christina so much more. For someone that he says is the best person, he'll never find anyone like her. She's amazing. Like it just, it's a bit hollow at the moment. And rejection is shit. It feels shit to reject someone that you think is a nice person like Christina. But the only thing worse than rejecting someone lovely like Christina is doing it in a really slow and drawn out way. Yeah, just pull off the plaster. And then at the end of the episode, we see all the couples kind of come back together and share the gossip about how the partner swap went. And let's just start back with Amy and Luke, because she's telling Luke 
all of the wonderful things that Adam does, which fair enough, he did. She kept saying, he trapped me like a princess. He trapped me like a princess. Yeah, he did. He absolutely did. And he does that for Polly too. So I don't think that this was just an Amy thing that he made coffee and nice breakfast. Adam seems to be quite nice to Polly as well. He just doesn't want to shag her, but he's nice. Like he genuinely is nice. And I do think if Amy is with Luke and Luke is not doing these little things and these little gestures like making your coffee in the morning and that's something that is really important to Amy and that she would like and that's kind of her love language she should absolutely you know let Luke know let him know that she would like that treatment that's something that is important to her however in doing this it nearly felt like she was trying to make him jealous like it really just felt like she was not getting this jealous explosive reaction from him so she kind of kept going and kept nudging and kept pushing and then she brought up the you know so what were your sleeping arrangements we shared a bed and Luke was like okay and you could tell that Luke was like oh I don't like this but he didn't feel like he had any right to say that and he kind of said to us you know in his confessional that he didn't really like here and that they shared a bed. It was a bit icky for him and he felt a bit hurt about it, but he didn't seem like he was holding anything against Amy. He wasn't going to give her a hard time over it. Meanwhile, over in Polly and Adam's house, Polly gets home and Adam has like this little Ann Summers haul, like Christmas morning laid out on the bed, like underwear and toys and like, you know, bit of kink, bit of light kink. She's very upset. Immediately, she's very upset. She goes off crying because you know, Amy's had a hand basically in this idea and she feels terrible about it. And he's, she, I think she says like he's messing with her head and she just wanted a bit of PDA and now he's gone from zero to 100. I'm like, I'm sorry, you were punching a bag and saying, if he doesn't put out soon, this is what you want to do to him. So don't try and make it out as though it wasn't, you know, sex that you wanted. It was just a kiss on the cheek in public. Like, no ma'am, like BS. So you're purely jealous because he was in a lingerie shop with Amy. And she even kind of gives him that real snappy, well, you've had a jolly time, haven't you? I'm like, no, a jolly time would be him shopping for lingerie for Amy to go and have sex with Amy. But no, here he is gifting you some lingerie, which is a complete waste of money because he's not even going to enjoy having sex with you. So like, at least just say, listen, I thanks for the thought. I see where you were going with this, but I feel a bit weird about it. No, she actually tries to like make him feel like a villain here as though she has absolutely no idea why he would do something like this and that she's disgusted by this gesture. And I'm just like, what do you actually want? You angry sex beggar. Like Adam will not win with this woman. He just will not win. And he does kind of seem like he's over it now. He's He's done his time on that couch being told that he's in the wrong and he needs to change. And now he's kind of at the point where he's like, listen, I'm damned if I do, damned if I don't. Why am I actually making this much effort for someone that I don't even fancy? So yeah, Adam has like straight up had it. And that's kind of where episode 26 ends. And we go straight into episode 27, which is the dinner party. And all of the couples kind of come back together and they're swapping stories from the partner swap week. And this dinner party made me so freaking mad, I have to say. I felt like Luke was crucified. (laughs) And again, like I said about Kieran earlier, good people can sometimes do the wrong thing, say the wrong thing. They can be flawed. They can make poor decisions. And Luke is an example of this. He absolutely has flaws. I think a lot of the criticisms Amy has of him are totally valid. I would probably not want to be with someone who like does the icky stuff like Luke does. But at the same time, I don't think Luke is all that bad a guy. I think he might do things that can give you the ick. He might people please. He might tell little white lies. But I don't think Luke is all that bad a guy I mean so shoot me I just think that there's a big difference between some of the more vindictive toxic types we've seen on this show and someone like Luke or someone like Kieran who they might not always act in the best way they might put their foot in their mouth or make mistakes but at their core they seem like pretty decent people so yeah I wasn't a big fan of this like witch hunt that we saw like people just wanted to put Luke's head on a pike and by people I mean the women like the majority of the women at this point just all ganged up on him and it felt very uncomfortable it felt very unfair and Sasha in particular really disappointed me 
it kind of seemed as though, you know, Alex is gone and she needs somebody else to vilify. And yeah, I use that word vilify. It's a very strong word. However, I mean it. I stand on it. I feel like Alex was a horrible human being. He really was worthy of Sasha's ire. However, I don't think Luke is in the same category as Alex. I think Luke is a decent guy. But Sasha had a clear target on his forehead. She was out for blood. Lacey was stirring up the pot and Amy just kind of nailed him to the cross. She stood back and let it all happen. Didn't stick up for him. And it was, yeah, it was a tough watch. The, the women didn't do me proud. So let's rewind and go back to the beginning of this episode. So episode 27, The Dinner Party. It starts out with Luke in the kitchen at home doing like this sexy butler in the buff type thing for Amy because Amy made a big song and dance about how Adam treated her like a princess and made her morning coffee and yada yada. So Luke is trying to give her what she's not so subtly hinted for and he's making her morning coffee and he's doing it in his own creepy icky way with this like apron around his you know lower section and his bum out and it's supposed to be cute it's supposed to be funny. I just saw it as he's taking on her feedback but he's doing it in a Luke kind of way if that makes sense but Amy is not happy. She's actually, she comes across like she's offended by the fact that he's got his bum out and I'm sorry you're asking him to park in the garage but you're offended by him doing a butler in the buff and having his bum out like fuck all the way off. I just, I I have such a bee in my bonnet for Amy this episode. And it's not good enough for her. She says, like, fair enough, take away the nudity. But she's like, I don't want him to make me a coffee. Well, she says it directly to him. I don't want you to make me a coffee just because you feel threatened by Luke. I want you to want to make me a coffee. Now, if anyone ever saw the breakup with Jennifer Aniston and Vince Vaughn, it reminded me of that. You know, like, I want you to want to go to the ballet. And it's like, sometimes you just don't want to go to the ballet. But you're willing to do that because the person that you love or the person that you're with enjoys it and you're going to do it for them and you're you know not going to make a fuss you're going to do it with a smile and to me this was what Luke was doing I for example had a boyfriend once whose best friend I could not stand he made my skin crawl I thought he was super sleazy he would make the most like sexist racist any kind of is jokes that weren't even funny they were just pig ignorant and every so often He would want to go out and have dinner, you know, with the two of us. I couldn't stick him. However, I did that. I would go and I would have the dinner or I would go to the cinema or I would go and get lunch and I would do it with a smile and I would try and be as pleasant as I can. Not because I wanted to hang out with best friend, but because I cared about my partner and he was my partner's best friend and he was actually a very good friend to my partner. So yeah, I'm going to do that because I care about the partner. So this bullshit of Amy saying she likes a man who will treat her like a princess and do little things like make her a coffee in the morning and here he is making her a coffee in the morning and you know bare ass aside it's not enough for her because she wants him to want to make the coffee not just do it because she told him she wants him to make coffee. I mean at this point if it's not good enough I feel like it's her problem. And then the whole thing about the butler and the buff past comes out. So He apparently told Amy that he never did any naked butlering. Is that, that's what it's called? Butling? I don't know. He never did like naked butler in the buff as like a job. He told her that he did like shirtless and club promos and stuff like that. Whereas now he's kind of let it slip. He's let the cat out of the bag that actually he, he did do that. So Amy's like, hold on a second. You told me you never did that. And you can see he's like a deer in headlights. He's like, oh, did I say that? She's like, yeah, no, you absolutely did. And that's a lie. And she's kind of catching him out in a lie, which is 100% fair, valid. He lied. She is correct. Do I think it's the worst lie in the world? Was there really like bad intentions there? Was he covering up something he shouldn't have done? No, he was probably just embarrassed. This was something long before he ever met her. I also feel like humans tell white lies. It's part of our nature, but okay, find find her a guy that's never told a white lie in his life. <laughs> I mean, no, she did. She absolutely, I'm not taking it away. She absolutely caught him in a lie. I just, yeah, at this point, I feel like she's looking for tits on an ant. But there's a chance that I'm being very unfair here. This could have been something at the very early stages that they talked about in their relationship. And had he been honest at that stage 
and she said listen you're not the kind of guy for me and would have gone a separate direction fair enough if that would have been a deal breaker for her I would understand more um so I don't know maybe maybe this is something that would have been a deal breaker for her and their entire relationship ever since has now been built on this lie if it's something that he had been honest about in the beginning and she wouldn't have given a hoot about I don't understand why it's a big deal but again it's subjective we're all gonna have different opinions on it I suppose I just I think she's been a battle axe we then swoop over to visit Adam and Polly and yeah she's <laughs> she's still actually trying to take the high ground here and act as though she's in the right and he is completely in the wrong and anything he says does not count. So yeah it's just the typical usual Polly reading Adam the riot act but he's actually kind of turning around and saying hold on not today Satan I'm not taking this shit I'm done. And he calls out that it's always him who has to change. It's always him who has to take feedback and make these little adjustments and try and walk on eggshells and do everything for her and make her happy. But the couple of things that he's expressed that are important to him, his boundaries, if you like, he kind of feels like none of that is being respected and she's not really doing all that much for him. So it's kind of the poly show is what he's saying. And he says, you know, I'm sick of constantly being put under this pressure. I've told you that I don't like openly talking about intimacy and in front of other people. And you just again and again, like disrespect that you disregard what I've said and you keep putting all this pressure on me. So here I am trying to do something for you that I thought you would like. And again, I'm wrong. I'm the bad guy. I'm in trouble. And Something that really jumped out about this interaction to me was that when he says that he feels like put under pressure by her, Polly immediately dismisses him and says, and I quote, that's bollocks. I don't ever make you feel like that. I don't speak to you enough about it to make you say there's pressure from me. Yeah, she said that. She said those words like that's the kind of crap that got Brad and Shona pulled from this show. She is on another planet. So she's now basically assuming charge of what Adam is allowed to feel and at what point he's allowed to feel it. Like again I know I I always say this but reverse the genders. I am screaming at my television and the mad part is I'm not even an Adam fan. I'm not particularly fond of him at all but this woman Polly is just so vile and as this is going on the doorbell rings and these envelopes start you know flying under the doors and it's basically a little drama stirring task that each couple has got to write a feedback letter to another couple so yeah what could go wrong and this is the point where Sasha starts to really really let me down so I've liked her from the start. I, I, I'm not going to say that I dislike her totally. I, I do see a lot of good in Sasha. However, who is this new version of Sasha that we have been getting for the last few weeks? Is it just that the herd has finally started to thin out that we're seeing more of each person that we're, you know, because we didn't really see a whole lot of Sasha and Ross up until their first argument. But anyway, they get the task, Ross and Sasha do, of writing a letter to Luke and Amy. And I mean, I'll say they because Ross says that he's fully complicit in this letter. But we all kind of know that this letter was Sasha's doing. Um, and it is, as Luke calls out later, just a pure personal attack on Luke. So let's just fast forward to the actual dinner party itself. So from the minute everyone arrives, there's not that many couples left. Actually, it does feel somewhat, I think someone says, it feels like we're at a small family Christmas dinner. That's kind of what it felt like. It's not the big long table anymore with lots of people. But from the minute they get there, it really is just pile on Luke. Like Amy is quick to tell people about the butler in the buff lie that she caught him in. Adam and Polly are there. They're not really getting along all that well. They're kind of talking to Amy. Amy looks kind of somewhat amused that they're not getting along. She's kind of doing the whole supportive thing, but not really. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not 100% about Amy and Adam at this point. There's, there's something a bit weird and too close for comfort there. 
but I still, at this point, I don't think Polly knows that they have shared the same bed. I would love to see that information provided, but yeah, if it was provided, I obviously missed it. And Amy is again bragging to High Heavens about how wonderful um, that Adam treated her. He treated her like a princess. She wanted for nothing. Lacey is taking this opportunity to tell Amy how well Luke treated her because Lacey and Luke were actually partnered up. And I thought Amy, or sorry, I thought Lacey and Luke had a really nice time. I thought that they buried the hatchet. I thought they went and had some fun. I thought that they had some really nice constructive conversations about their relationships. However, do you remember earlier on when I said that Luke said to Lacey, you know, looking back, I do feel like I was maybe envious when I looked at that picture of you that he had kind of made the unsavory comments about and you're so uninhibited and you're having fun. I'm paraphrasing here. He basically said to Lacey, I felt envious. I felt jealous that I can't dance that way with Amy. Amy won't dance that way with me. And it was very clear at the time to Lacey what he meant by that because she regurgitated it back to the camera for our benefit. However, here she is sitting with Amy and that's not how she kind of spins it. And I don't know with Lacey if this is intentional or if this is just completely her being absent-minded and not realising that she's stirring the pot. The jury is kind of out there. I want to give her the benefit of the doubt. I really want to. But here she is sitting with Amy and she tells Amy, oh, you know, Luke actually said to me, that picture, I'll be honest, when I saw it, Deep down, I was jealous because I wish Amy would be that way. And she leaves out that tiny little part at the end where he said, I wish Amy would be that way with me. He wasn't saying that he wished Amy was off, you know, hanging off some other guy's dick on a dance floor. So Amy is like, well, hold on. He said he was happy that I didn't conduct myself that way, that I conduct myself with more class. But then he's telling you that he wants me to be off doing that kind of stuff. So I can see why Amy would be pissed off with that and would kind of think he's talking out of two sides of his face. However, that is not at all what he said. So Amy is now gunning for Luke, not that she needed much of a nudge anyway, but she is fuming. And then they all sit down to dinner and they start exchanging these letters. Now, a lot of the letters were pretty accurate, I would say. So Polly and Adam get a letter basically saying exactly what Adam has been saying, you know, that sometimes Polly should make more of an effort to respect his boundaries. And you can tell by her face that she is just so unimpressed. She does not want to take anything in this letter on board. However, the silence is deafening when it comes to people, you know, swooping in to back up Polly or to speak up in her defense. Nobody is saying Jack, it is crickets. So I think she can kind of read the room and gauge that, you know, this is probably something that everyone is thinking and she has no other choice but to say, I'm very sorry for my actions. And she even squeezes out a couple of tears because she just feels so bad that she has crossed Adam's boundaries. I do, however, believe that if Holly had still been there and was speaking up on Polly's behalf or in her defence, that Polly's apology to Adam would probably have come with a lot more conditions, caveats, you know, at the end. You know, I'm sorry, but you did X, Y and Z. So, yeah, I just I really don't see her as someone who wants to take much accountability. Then we get we don't really get much from Christina and Kieran's letters and um Nathan and Lacey's letters they're they're pretty meh they're nice they're pleasant uh good advice given Sasha and Ross get a letter that basically kind of says that you know Sasha sometimes even though you're trying to be protective and it's coming from a good place you could probably be a little suffocating so maybe just you know watch that keep an eye on that and you can tell that Sasha's a bit like <laughs> she doesn't like that there's a criticism in there and it's not just directed at her. There is also some criticism for Ross. It says something along the lines of, you know, for some people taking off your wedding ring in an argument would be game over. And it said in the letter, um, one of us thinks that your relationship will make it beyond the experiment. The other one of us does not think it will. And that kind of, I think that 
might have been a bit irritating towards Sasha as well. However, there was a lot of really nice stuff in the letter. So they kind of decide we're not going to dwell on the negatives. Let's just take the nice stuff and move on. It says something along the lines of, you know, Ross, we can see that you're an amazing dad. And he gets so emotional. He bursts out crying and it means the world to him that someone has acknowledged that within the group. So that was really nice to see. Then it gets to Amy and Luke's letter. So Amy opens up the letter and starts reading. And we know obviously that Ross and Sasha have given them this letter. And Sasha just lights up with this like evil smile. It's like she's anticipating a big fight. And she's got her hand like clutching the nape of Ross's neck beside her as though he's some attack dog already. It's a very strange stance that she takes on here. And the letter basically just goes straight in and says, you know, I think Luke just gets involved in other people's relationships for attention and he needs to learn how to put Amy before his need for attention. And I just, when I heard this, it reminded me of when Sasha was having that big massive argument with Alex and Luke went and sat beside Alex so that he didn't feel totally alone. And part of me, even though I can't stand Alex, like F Alex, I just kind of feel like maybe that has now been a thorn in Sasha's side and she's now kind of looking at Luke and remembering that you went and sat next to that asshole when I was having my argument with him. So now she's saying that he gets involved in other people's relationships because he needs attention. I think it's rich. I I definitely think a lot of people in this cast are guilty of that. Polly, again, I'm such a Polly hater. Polly is number one for me on that list. She gets involved in everybody's relationship. And over the last kind of two weeks or so, Sasha's been one of the more vocal people on this. She's been right there in the mix. So I just think it's a bit of a weird criticism to throw out. And the minute Amy finishes reading this letter, I think the whole table is a bit like, oh God, that was uncomfortable to listen to. Like straight away, Sasha kind of slaps her hands together and smiles and volunteers. This was our letter. We wrote this letter. And she's just, she's being very confrontational. And she continues and says, you know, I feel like you just want airtime. You're trying to find your camera. I think everything that you say is bullshit. And it's like she's just kind of trying to provoke a reaction and trying to get him to snap back at her. And he doesn't take the bait. And I really appreciate that from Luke in this moment because I do not want to see her get what she's clearly asking for right now, which is a big, huge drama, a big, huge scene. And it's ironic that she's accusing him of trying to, you know, get airtime and find your camera. When here she is, this task was to give feedback to a couple. All of the couples seem to have given each other genuine feedback. But this letter to Amy and Luke was exactly as Luke calls it, just a personal attack. Luke says, where was the advice in this letter? This was just an attack. And he's absolutely right. I'm very, very disappointed in Sasha. I'm very happy Luke didn't give her the fight that she so clearly wanted to have with him. And yeah, she's got an issue with him. She chose this task to try and air that. Not a great choice. And Amy was absolutely no use. She did not have Luke's back whatsoever in this moment. She just kind of sat back and let him get attacked. And Sasha also throws out the whole thing about him telling Lacey, I was envious, you know, I wish well, the distorted version that Lacey kind of brought to the table that he wishes that Amy would be more like that. And it just, it turns into this like swirling tornado. It's like a witch's coven. It's icky, it's horrible. And I I didn't enjoy watching it whatsoever. I felt really, really bad for Luke. And that's kind of where the dinner party ended. It was uncomfortable to watch. I didn't enjoy it. It was, I kind of wish that somebody would have had us back a little bit more, even just to say, listen, lads, take it down a bloody notch, you know, like it's not necessary. But anyway, we now get into episode 28. There's two parts of Homestays. So we're going to start with Homestays part one. Don't know which one was more disastrous, but we'll do it in order. Episode 28 starts off with the return of the horny goat that is Lacey's mother. I swear to God, like this family. I hope this was as staged as it looked honestly like with the three of them with the cups of tea in the doorway because if this wasn't completely staged and choreographed by production and this was actually the way things went down then the hills really do have eyes because 
this was so creepy and disturbing. I think this dynamic between Lacey's mom and Nathan, then Lacey's mom with Nathan and Lacey as a couple, and then Lacey's mom trying to like involve Lacey's very pretty but previously mute bobblehead sister who now suddenly speaks, which it's very weird. And at times the mother is like trying to raise concerns that he said wow to Lacey's sister and he said she was beautiful and that's a bit of a red flag but then on the other hand she's like trying to initiate conversation and common ground between Nathan and the pretty bobblehead and look how much you guys have in common and then bringing her into the room and jumping on the bed while Lacey and Nathan are in their bed it's just it was so weird I don't know if they were going for cute. I don't know if they were going for like really kitschy and close knit. The last time we saw Lacey's mom, she was crying into fajitas because Nathan made a joke. She was struggling to understand the concept of vegetarianism and the sister was kind of just sitting there silently looking concerned that the mother was crying and it was just super awkward. It was really, really awkward. However, now she's taking a completely different approach and they're being super nice and super talkative and super friendly and super complimentary of Nathan, specifically his looks and his handiness. Yeah, ew. So Lacey is sitting down with the mom and the sister and Nathan and she's saying, oh, you know, he's really good with his hands. He's really handy around the house. He's good with DIY. And the mother's like, oh, TMI is good with his hands. And I just, oh God, my stomach it practically fired a warning shot at me. And then later we do see her actually call Nathan out to the hall and she's like, oh, I've got a job for you, Nathan. You're going to paint my hall stairs in London. Or <laughs> like, like, what the fuck? Like some shit. So that's why I'm really hoping that this was staged and Nathan was fully in on this and it's all meant to be tongue in cheek for the audience. Because like I said, if this actually is what happened without production, setting it up it is too icky to even like think about could you imagine if Lacey or any of the female participants for that matter went you know on their homestay they went to the other person's house and it was like an all-male family home and it was like a brother and a dad or an uncle and we had like some middle-aged man say to the girl oh I heard you're great with your hands you know here get out there and wash my car and the whole time he's like behind her like gently stroking her back and you know telling her if he was 20 years younger like it makes my skin crawl I don't understand why Lacey's mom thinks that this is in any way acceptable or anybody wants to see this or Nathan wants her you know stroking his back or complimenting his looks in that way it's just lecherous there's a big difference between saying oh you're a really handsome guy you know I'm I'm glad my daughter found someone so lovely and handsome like you and being just flat out sleazy, like the mom gives me the creeps, I'm just gonna say, she gives me the creeps, I'm not suggesting that she's that kind of L1 who goes and drunkenly offers to flash her tits to get out of paying for taxi fares or drinks, or peruses prison inmate matchmaker sites, but she kind of reminds me of the kind of person that you would find within that neighbourhood. Then we shoot over to Adam's house because Polly is, you know, going to his place first for homestays. She is quite hurt that he hasn't made closet space for her. Now, I can see her point. It it is the gesture more than the logistics of it, isn't it? But let's be real, his place is compact. His place is gorgeous, but it's compact. And she is there, let's be real, for a day or two. So deal with it. Just live out of your fucking suitcase it's not the personal attack that you seem to think it is now I have to just gush for a minute about Adam's little compact home because it is so beautifully decorated it is so neat it's like porn to me I cannot live up to that level of neatness and um I just yeah I'm fascinated by people who can keep such a clean lovely house it looks like it smells really good too and I appreciate that And Adam's friend is coming over for dinner. Polly is going to cook them both a meal. She's still kind of on her apology tour. She's trying to make it up to Adam. He's giving her the cold shoulder a bit. And I don't know if he's like giving it to her a bit extra just to, you know, make a point. Or it's just that he's really just over it at this stage. But his friend is really lovely. The friend kind of tries to talk him down the friend is very nice towards Polly he says that he's met her a few times and she's been very pleasant and I have to say even back as far as the wedding I remember thinking 
Adam was a knob from the get-go. But I do remember thinking his friends were quite decent and they seemed really grounded. So he does appear to have a great group of friends around him. And that's always a good sign about a person, isn't it? I mean, like if someone has a really good friend, you always have to kind of think they, they can't be that bad. But it all kicks off and it gets really tense and Polly kind of storms off. Now, Adam was being very rude. He was kind of saying he was ragging on the dinner that she made. And yeah, he was just laying it on a bit too thick. I think he overplayed his hand. <laughs> he probably could have kept like the, the cold shoulder thing going for a while and gotten more out of it. But he overplayed his hand and he, he got a bit too mean. And the next morning we kind of see them have another fight and he just, he manages her very well, I have to say. He tells her, you know, you don't apologise. And she's like, well, sometimes I need to, I can't remember the word she used, sometimes I need to like process how I think. And he's like, it, there's nothing to process. I, you've done, you've said something wrong. You apologise for saying something wrong because it's hurt me. And interestingly, Polly is like, you can't tell me how I process things. Now, if I remember correctly, wasn't Polly but one episode ago telling Adam that she doesn't make him feel the way that he says she makes him feel and that she hasn't mentioned sex enough to make him feel pressured. So he's, he can't say that he feels pressured. So here she is, the shoe's on the other foot and she does not like it. But eventually they do make up somewhat and then they head off to Polly's place because they're going to do homestays with her family and friends. And do you know what? It is actually, it's quite a decent homestay, I think. Like, Adam gets on really well with her niece and nephew. He's really good with the kids. And her friend Alfie is there. Now, Alfie is a familiar face. We've seen Alfie before. He is not a fan of Adam. We know this. However, even though that stance has not changed because he's still not a fan of Adam, I really like Alfie. He doesn't go out of his way to make Adam feel unwelcome or to try and make him feel uncomfortable or attacked or interrogated he's like a very chill kind of mellow energy and he's friendly enough towards Adam like he's not friendly in a fake kind of way he doesn't lay it on too thick and he waits for Adam to kind of leave the room and then kind of says to Polly well listen I'll be honest I still have all the concerns that I've expressed already and Alfie has a lovely way Considering that Polly's someone who does not take criticism, she does not really take accountability for anything. Like Alfie has a nice way of giving her a critique or some, you know, negative feedback, venting his concerns, if you like, in a gentle, friendly, loving way. Like it's constructive and it's very non-threatening. And she does seem to actually take what Alfie says on board. So I think that that friendship is gold it is gold standard I hope they both hang on to that friendship so often in these homestays and we'll talk about it in the next episode we see friends who are there to just be attack dogs and they just take what their friend says at face value they don't question it and they will go and they will attack like the hounds of hell without verifying any of the information for themselves without even considering the fact that maybe their friend has a part to play in any negativity and they always do it under this guise of like loyalty and friends you know first no there's being loyal and then there's just being a mindless puppet very different things so I can't say enough good stuff about Alfie like that kind of friend is so valuable in life but anyway Ross and Sasha now head to Manchester and they're going to Ross's neck of the woods first and Sasha is getting to meet his daughter Blue. I have to say I'm not much of a kid person but Blue is super cute and she does look a lot like Ross when she does her little cheeky smile. Super super cute. I in my head had it that she was older for some reason. I was a bit surprised that she was so young but she's absolutely precious and Ross is so in love with that little girl. It's clear as day and it's mutual. She loves her dad. So super cute to watch and Sasha is, you know, in tears watching this and at first I thought, you know, she's just, she's so taken by how sweet this moment is but actually <laughs> she tells us she's thinking about her relationship with her dad. I mean, of, of course she is. Why wouldn't she be? You know, every woman in her 30s is brought to tears whenever she sees an infant cuddling with their dad because... They also wish they were currently cuddling with their dad. It's, it's all a bit much. And later they go and visit the rest of Ross's family. So we meet like his nan and his sister who just looks like a 
bad ass bitch she's so pretty as well her eyes her eyes are really really pretty can't think of her name for the life of me but she pulls Ross to the side and she kind of says like look give me the story you know what's going on how are things between you guys while we have a moment alone and Ross mentions to his sister that Sasha might not want to move all the way to Manchester so he kind of floats the idea of him moving to Birmingham and kind of says to the sister you know how would you feel if I was to move out that way? And the sister is like her face. She is only short of slapping that idea straight out of his head. Straight away, she's like, it's a no from me. That is not going to happen. I feel like Ross's sister and Sasha's mom would get on really well. I also don't feel like Ross's sister is too enamored with Sasha it doesn't re- now we didn't see a lot obviously but I just I don't get the impression that she's got all the warm and fuzzy feelings towards Sasha I don't know if it's just because Ross has like mentioned this idea of him possibly moving or if there's other reasons but yeah Ross's sister is like a hard pass on him and Sasha running off into the sunset together specifically in the direction of Birmingham so uh yeah that's a no And that's kind of where part one of the homestays ends. And then we go into part two. So this is tonight's episode. What number are we on now? Episode 29. I'm going to say 29. If I'm wrong, I apologize. But it's Monday night's episode. It's the Amy and Luke episode. Let's just call it that because let's call a spade a spade. This episode was all about Amy and Luke. So let's just skip over Christina and Kieran. I'm not even going to waste my breath. I've said everything that I need to say on these two they are separate they're not going home to each other's you know places they're with their individual families and they're just recounting the story the road so far and what the issues are at this point in time we've been there we've done that we've worn the t-shirt I'm exhausted talking about it I just want them to say leave at this point we get the second half of Sasha and Ross's homestays which is Ross going down to Sasha's deck of the woods to visit her family and she she says a really interesting thing. So Ross and Sasha are sitting with the mom and the dad and the topic of geography comes up, shall we say, which is, you know, the logistics of the distance between them and does she move to Manchester to be near Ross because it would be really hard for him to move there and be away from his infant daughter. I mean, obviously, I'm not like, listen, I'm close to my family. I would never move away from, well, certain members of my family I wouldn't want to move away from. Others I couldn't get far away enough from. But I do get it, like, moving a couple of hours from family that you see and speak to every day would be extremely challenging, 100%. However, if you want to pursue a relationship and potentially a long-term relationship, and it's between you moving away from your parent and them having to move away from their infant child. I mean, I'm not saying it's an easy decision, but only one of those children is in their formative years. The other one is in her 30s. But anyway, they're sitting there and they're talking about the whole, you know, who moves and what's the story. And the parents at first are kind of playing it cool and they're not really saying, you know, what we know that they're thinking. They're kind of giving Sasha and Ross just space to talk. And Sasha says something really interesting that I kind of went, wait, what did she just say? She says to her mom and her dad, with Ross sitting there beside her, she says to them, I just really worry, you know, I don't want to be in a town far away from you and, you know, Ross loses his temper. I mean, what the actual F? Why would she say that? Like, yes, they've had a big fight. Ross has lost his temper and they've worked through it they've made up he's apologized profusely and he's accepted that he was totally in the wrong there however the like that comes across as though Ross is some kind of nutcase like he's dangerous like I just think that was a really strange way to phrase it I mean you could say I'd hate to be so far away from you guys and me and Ross had a fight and I'd be all by myself because my friends aren't near my family's not near like fair enough 100% but turning around to your family and saying god what if I was to move away with Ross and you know then he lost his temper and you guys weren't nearby that has very different undertones there and I didn't like it at all and I was very surprised that Ross didn't react to that like it was just it was very strange I thought 
And then the parents do kind of, they go and they visit the nan and a couple of the aunties, I think, and some more family. And then the parents kind of decide to come out with how they really feel. And Sasha's mom is like, Sasha, you have to stay here. And Sasha gets really emotional because she's like, oh God, I really can't leave my family. And then I noticed that all the clocks in my house had stopped and, you know... <laughs> I'm sorry, the mother sounds like Pizazu from The Exorcist. Am I the only person that hears that? Like, it's uncanny. But anyway, it's not looking like there's going to be an easy road ahead for Sasha and Ross. I, It's not going to work. Let's just call a spade a spade. Sasha's never going to move away from Daddy Dearest. And Ross is not going to move away from his child. So, I mean, shake hands and be done with it. So, the rest of the episode is pretty much just Amy being a massive dickhead. So anyway, they go to Luke's place first and it's this cute kind of like cottage core type place. I don't actually remember. Did we even see like any of Luke's friends or Luke's family? Like I can't actually remember. All of Amy's antics has completely overshadowed like anything else in this episode. But basically they're pulling up outside Luke's house and Amy is already starting to kind of like poke and prod at him and she's like oh am I going to get to see the real Luke now because she's on one about him being a liar and being fake and contradicting himself so she really is someone who values honesty but like to the point where a white lie will make you the devil in her eyes and she will never forgive you and she will forever try to trap you in more white lies so they get into the house and there is a picture on Luke's fridge and it looks like it it's you know you see them when you're on dating sites all the time of like guys and girls where it's clearly been cut down the middle because they were obviously in a photo with another guy or another girl so there's this photo of Luke that's been cut down the middle and she says oh god is who was in that picture and he tries to like it's like he's panicking and he doesn't want to offend her and he's like oh no that was just a it's a really thin picture which is just like the dumbest thing ever And then he kind of pivots and she's like, it's got jagged edges. And already I'm like, oh, just leave it alone. Like, leave it alone. Then he's like, oh, I think it was just like some guy was in it with me, some randomer. And I just cut it out because like, why would I have a randomer on my fridge? You know, there. And the more he talks, the more you can tell. It was clearly a picture of him and some chick. But again, this was before he knew Amy. Who gives a crap if he has a photograph? that he had taken with some girl god knows how long ago and he's cut her out of the picture to in a strange way when you think about it just leave a slim picture of you on your own fridge it is strange but I mean he's a good looking guy so he's left this picture there but Amy is just she obviously knows like she knows what what's happened here it's not some smoking gun some gotcha moment or deep dark secret like she's not catching him cheating on her but she keeps pulling the thread and pulling the thread and trying to make it into this again this monstrosity you're a liar why are you lying you keep lying to me and Luke eventually just says yeah okay fine there was some girl in it some girl that I met that night and we took a picture together and I cut her out of it and I didn't want to say to you because I didn't want you to feel weird and start asking me then oh who was she which you can kind of understand but at the same time you wouldn't expect to be interrogated about something so ridiculous and so minor but Amy is just at the point where no matter what Luke says or does it's going to be wrong and she's going to take offense to it and every time I think that something is like eye roll oh god really she does something worse and that's the kind of trend that we see in this episode. So after the refrigerator picture issue, they're out at some like castle grounds. It's it's a really pretty place. I can't remember where it was, but it's like this big, lovely castle. It's a wedding venue type place. And they're looking out over the beautiful rolling hills. And he makes some kind of sexual innuendo or some comment, excuse me. And again, she's taking offense she's pissed off she's like the experts have told you you need to stop doing this you're creeping me out you're making me cringe you're giving me the ick or whatever it was she said now that's absolutely fair if someone is making kind of sexual innuendos or comments that make you uncomfortable again and again and again that is absolutely fair break up with them break up with them you do not have to continue to be with them she's choosing to stay with him but just to punish him which is weird It is who he is. He's not going to change his entire personality. And 
I know this probably sounds really offensive to some people, but if I have been in a relationship with someone and we're having sex, I make sexual innuendos all the time to them. If they turned around to me and said, listen, you make me really uncomfortable when you make suggestive jokes like that. And I would really appreciate it if you would stop trying to sexualize me because it just creeps me out. I would probably cease that relationship because that would be like a flirty love language, in my opinion. I, I can't I can't understand how you are in a sexual relationship with someone who you say that you fancy, which I don't believe, but you're asking them to park their car in your garage, but you're massively offended and creeped out when they make a sexual innuendo. Like, I mean, it just, the math doesn't math. And fair enough, if, you know, it's gotten old and you just don't like it and you don't want them to do it anymore, that is fine. But when that's all they ever do, you probably need to just cut your losses and walk away. I mean, you won't be wrong for it, but you are wrong for staying and expecting them to change their entire personality. Just go be with Adam. He will be available very, very soon, I assure you. But anyway, we then see them reverse and Luke goes to Amy's hometown. And I just felt like I was watching a lamb go to the slaughter. I was like, God, like what mischief is afoot here I was expecting her whole family to be there with like baseball bats waiting to take shots at him and tell him that he's the worst person in the world but they get to Amy's house and there's like this little sausage dog and he's so cute he's so so cute and the dog loves Luke and Luke loves the dog a little bit too much it's a bit of tongue action which is a bit disturbing and unnecessary but um listen he'll take whatever tongue he can get and I'm happy for them <laughs> <laughs> the nice mood and glow of being in the house and seeing the dog does not last long because they're walking up the stairs which is just lined with pictures of Amy and one of the pictures she actually stops and points out and says oh you know look at this picture and it's basically her pre everything that she's had done to her face now I don't know what she's had done I don't care to speculate on what she's had done what I will say it looks like a different person. If you had have shown me that picture, I would not have immediately said, oh, that's Amy from Maths. No, they look like two completely different women. And at this point, before Luke even opens his mouth, we know it's a no win. Either he's going to say, oh, you looked beautiful in that picture and she'll be offended because, you know, you're supposed to say I look beautiful now. Or he's going to say, oh, you look beautiful now, you know, much better than you were before. And she's going to be offended. So like there's there's literally no way that he is going to win in this situation. His best bet would have been to just pretend to fall back down the stairs and hope that she doesn't come back to this picture later on. But of course he chooses to say, you know, oh, you look so much better now. And he says, is this you, you know, after your glow up or whatever. Now, <laughs> to be fair the things that he chooses to say they're not the best they are offensive but two points I will make in his defense number one she's being an asshole for the last couple of days so at this point I want him to just troll her I want him to say mean shitty things to her because if she's going to be mad and treat him like crap anyway he might as well just come out with whatever crap pops into his head and English is not his first language so <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not completely excusing it, but I, I think there's also an element of panic in there because every time he says something, she gets more and more offended and he's trying to fix it and he's trying to backtrack and he just keeps making it worse. So she tries to say, what do you mean a glow up? I All I've had done is my lips and I'm like, oh, okay. And then he says something about, you know, oh, you are skinnier now in this photo you look and he's trying to search for the word and he's like bloated I'm like oh Jesus Christ that like bloated I just I face palmed I just wanted to be like Luke abort 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 but eh, yeah I feel like he was wasted with Amy him and Emma would have made so much sense <laughs> I feel like Emma would have been the happiest woman on earth to have been partnered with Luke and I think Luke would have given it his all. He would have just buzzed off Emma's energy and they probably would have given us comedic gold for the entire length of this season. But alas, it was not to be. But anyway, the next morning they wake up in the bedroom. They're in her mum's house apparently. This isn't Amy's house, it's her mammy's house. And they're lying in bed, they're cuddling with the dog but it doesn't stay nice for long because 
he mentions something about a damp spot up in the top corner which it shows us and it does kind of look a bit like a damp spot but anyway he uses the word mold and she is offended again that he has accused this house of having mold and that's gonna be super offensive and it's gonna be super hurtful to her mom it's her mom's house and at this point I just want her to go away I just I want her to go away <laughs> far far away <laughs> and yeah it doesn't, like I said, it, it doesn't get better. It just continuously gets worse. So next they go clothes shopping because they want to go out and have drinks with Amy's friends. And I just, I had flashbacks, like trauma flashbacks of, do you remember Arthur and, was her name Laura or Lauren? You know, the one that wanted a Chelsea boy and she had those vile friends that used to just make Arthur feel like absolute shite all last season. Yeah, I had flashbacks of these witches. So strap in. So they don't really get through the clothes shopping very successfully because they start an argument. Well, they don't start an argument. Amy starts harping on about the mold comment again. So um, yeah, she's really, really looking for tits on an ant here, guys. But we get done with the shopping. We go out and we meet the friends and there's not just one friend. There's not just two friends. There's three friends and they're all sitting like a firing line on one side of the table. And Amy and Luke sit down. They say hello and straight away Luke says, I'll get up and I'll go get us all some drinks. So they say, yeah, thank you. Great. He goes off to the bar to get some drinks and straight away she's nearly in tears. She's telling them, oh God, it's terrible. It's awful. I'm having such a bad time. But she says to them, I really, really fancy him. And she keeps repeating, you know, I really, really fancy him. And he's amazing. Lie, lie, lie. Like you're calling him out for white lies. Are you honestly trying to tell us, the audience, after everything that we've seen, that you fancy this man. I do not believe it for a second. But she tells the friends basically in a really kind of quick fashion because Luke is going to be coming back any minute. It's not going great. I really fancy him. He's amazing. But he just keeps putting his foot in it and he, he says that there was mold in my mom's house. And the friends are kind of like looking at her like she has three heads at first. So I thought that they might have been reasonable and they might have given a decent chance to Luke. And he's approaching the table and she kind of says, just ask him loads of questions, ask him loads of questions. So he sits down and one of the friends kind of, you know, takes charge and says, so Luke, tell me about yourself. And it just immediately feels like the interview from hell. And he says, oh, well, I'm Luke, I'm from Malta, I'm here for however many years, I work I think he works in a prison, did he say? I wasn't really, I'm not a great active listener. I'm working in a prison and the friend's like, and what else? What you do in your spare time? And he says, eh, well, I like to woodwork. I play a little guitar. And she's like, and what else? And it was very, very strange and very weirdly aggressive. And um, Amy kind of starts nudging him going, yeah, what else do you do? Is there anything else? And he kind of picks up on the energy here and says, is there something in particular that you want to ask me about? And Amy kind of hints about the butler thing. And this is where it gets really mean. And she kind of brings up the whole butler and the buff lie. And he says, yeah, you know, I have done that once or twice. I've done it occasionally. I wouldn't say that I do it in my spare time, like in an ongoing way. But Amy just brings up the whole way that he backtracked and he first said he didn't do it and then he did it and the friends kind of take this cue from her and latch onto it and they're asking you know is this something that you want to continue on you're married do you think that's something that you're going to do again and they're snickering about it and they're giggling about it and they're being really just mean spirited and that one friend with the flat hair and the dead eyes she's like well why would you lie about it that's a red flag you know right at the beginning of a marriage to lie about it I'm like zip it just zip it and then she turns around to Luke who to his credit completely calls this out and he says listen this is not a nice way to introduce like me to people you've just basically created an opportunity to call me a liar in front of strangers once again like this feels like there's an agenda here that this is all kind of gearing towards some attack on me and he's absolutely 100% right and they know that they're being called out very rightfully so and very quickly and he is not going for this and one of the friends says you know what are what are your intentions towards her what are your intentions towards my friend and he says well do you know what right now 
not a damn thing. I am a single man. And he takes off the ring and he puts it down and says, there's clearly an agenda here. You know, I'm not playing this game and I'm delighted for him. And when he does that, Amy goes apeshit. I think that she thought she was just going to continue because he's not someone who gets very riled up. He's not someone that will like lash out and get very irate. He tends to just take it and take it and take it. And here's the point where he he very calmly and very respectfully said, I'm done, like I'm done taking this and I'm not going to sit here and be a whipping boy to these complete strangers. I literally walked in the door. I went and bought them drinks like an idiot. I sat down and I'm being attacked. And Amy is like in his face, screaming at him, telling him to, you know, get the F out of here. And he's like, no, I'm sitting, I'm having a chat. So she gets up and she walks off to the bar with one of her friends. And then the two other friends, like little cockroaches, scatter away from the table after her. And Luke is just kind of left sitting there. And I just, I'm like, go Luke, just get up, get your coat, walk out that door and do not come back. I wouldn't even show up to the commitment ceremony for her. She is not worth it. She is a total cow and she needs a reality check. There are much worse people out there than Luke. And he's not going to be everyone's cup of tea. He's not going to be you know, everyone's ideal partner, that is fine. A lot of her criticisms of him, I can fully see. I do not deny that a lot of her criticisms are valid, but don't be with him. It's as simple as that. If you don't like the majority of someone's personality, you can leave. <laughs> like you, you don't stay and try and make their life a misery from here until the end of time because you think that they should be different. It's just, yeah, massive cow, friends are cows. That was the, the gist of the episode. So that is it for tonight. I'll be back again later in the week with our next maths video and I'll also be out on Friday. I'm going to binge watch this week's Love Triangle in one go. So it'll probably be Friday when I release my Love Triangle Australia season two video. But until then guys, have a lovely evening and as always, sweet dreams.